Anyway, I want to talk a little bit tonight about deception. And uh, I'm only going to be 10 minutes because we're going to move on and do something else later. But there's a story um, in uh, Exodus 32, and it actually talks about how people get into the whole thing of deception. And I want to just uh, look at it for a few minutes because I don't want anybody to go there. I know for, for a fact that I've been there, and I know for a fact that I know where when others go there, um, but it's not a very nice place. And uh, although, you know, the guy made it look very, very nice when it's all about magic, the actual condition of being deceived, if you're on the end of de- being deceived or you're in it, it's not very nice at all. So that made it very glamorous, but deception isn't nice. And so I want to talk just for a few minutes um, about deception. Now, in this story, in Exodus 32, and you can go away and read it if any of you are still in the habit of reading the Bible, because uh, I don't know if many people do that anymore. You tend to, you know, listen to what's going on here and you take it and that's it. But if you want to go and read it, basically, Moses had gone up the mountain to have a chat with God. And it was at the time when he was going to be given the, uh, the law, which was the Ten Commandments uh, that were written in stone. If you remember this story, the children of Israel had come out uh, of Egypt by an incredible miracle. And I mean, if you think about it, how fantastic that they end up in this place where Moses goes up to the mountain to meet God. And all of a sudden, they are left by themselves to their own devices And they start to have thoughts about where's Moses? He's supposed to be our leader. What's going on? Has he abandoned us? Because he's been gone for a jolly long time. And so they start to conjure up all sorts of ideas about their leader and about what's happening to them. Now, we have to say that um, uh, the whole issue of deception starts when we start to believe wrong things. It starts because we have negative thoughts and they become negative beliefs and then they become negative attitudes and then we take action based on all that put together and it's like we start living out this conjured up idea without there being any thread of truth to any of it. But this is what happens. If you think about it, Moses might have deserved to be moaned at for going up a mountain and leaving them for a while. But he had brought them out of the land of Egypt. And it's funny how we let little things that happen create a new story rather than remembering the bigger story, the bigger picture. So I don't think it was fair for them to be uh, upset with Moses, but the word. So whether we like it or not, deception starts with an offence and it replaces truth with lies and the, uh, the real with false. And we may have been in a situation for a very long time believing wonderful things, but all of a sudden there's a change in our minds about things that we have been convinced about all our lives and then it makes such a, a change to everything. So... Then what we do is we decide to act very differently and we separate ourselves from the things we were convinced about for a very long time and then we join ourselves to things that are brand new that have not had any, um, what's, the, what's the phrase I'm looking for? Any, any opportunity to prove themselves but we say this has got to be better than this because this has let me down just this once or whatever. And so then we create a language somehow to try and just, uh, justify ourselves where we are. And it's just really weird that when you get to the end of this story, they're basically, they've pulled in all of their jewellery into a big melting pot and we have the story of the golden calf and they're all dancing around it saying this is our God now because Moses has gone off somewhere, he hasn't come back, clearly God wasn't there or if he was there he must have zapped him and he's now dead so we'll create something for ourselves. Now I've put that in a nutshell for you haven't I but that's what happened. Do you think these people were a bit deceived? I think so. Had Moses real, really done anything to deserve that sort of mis- mistrust? I don't think so. But that's where we were. So, 
quickly, how do I deal with deception? First of all, I have to accept that I've become offended in some way and recognize that this has changed my thoughts, my beliefs, my attitudes towards things that I used to hold very dear. And I've got to get rid of that offense and I've got to reestablish myself back with those things. I've got to wipe the slate clean. I've got to try and put things right. I've got to not let offense stay in my bones because it will eat me away. I've got to forgive everything and I've got to reestablish truth in the place of the lie. And it means letting go of what might bring you an awful lot of pleasure. Oh, you didn't expect I was going to say that. You see, often people think that deception is such a bad place that you know you're in this terrible place. But actually, like Anthe once said, and it was quite fantastic, a deceived man doesn't know he's deceived. And because they don't know they're deceived, they actually think that where they are is absolutely wonderful. And the children of Israel dancing around this golden calf, they had something that they could see. They could have something that meant something to them rather than something that they had to reach out for or by faith get with because it's always easier to believe what you see rather than what you can't. Is this making sense to you? I hope it is. So we can want something so bad, the thing that meets our need, just like the golden calf met the children of Israel's need, we can have created that because of the condition that we are in and then it is so very hard to let go of it. Now, when I come to my next stage, I'm going to talk next little part. I'm going to talk about how one of the worst issues that we have where we get deceived is in the area of love. It's a very deceptive thing. And so I hope you young people are going to listen because I want to bring something that might just help you in your lives not make horrible mistakes because if we understand how love can be so deceptive and so deceiving, then we might be able to avoid that pitfall. But here's the issue. If you are deceived tonight because you have found yourself in a situation where something that you once held dear, you don't hold dear anymore and you have created something else to take its place, it, it can be anything. It's not just about people. It can be all sorts of things. I want you tonight to just hear these words and just like that you saw on the, the film, decide that it can look very beautiful, but actually ultimate, it's a, it's a lie. And it's not good for us to be found in that place. So I'm going to finish there. Well, something else is going to happen now and then you'll get part two in a little while. I hope that was concise and okay and I'll be back in a minute. Okay, part two. I think I like it all in one best. Um, <clears throat> but we're trying. Um, like I said before, the area where I find people tend to get incredibly deceived is in the area of love. And um, where do I start? Okay. Well, for me, let me put it this way, because I want to show you how I'm associating the two, because you might say, well, you know, why have you done what you did at the beginning? Well, you know, for me, 10 years ago, where I fell into a, a big dose of deception, or you could say big doses, little doses, I don't know whether that's the way to put it, but I did fall into a most incredible uh, de deception. And... Um, it was in the area of love because often it's amazing how if you think that you're not loved by somebody, that might not be true, but if you feel you're not loved by somebody and then somebody else seems to show you love, can you see where the, the deception is easily fallen for? And um, the reason why uh, I felt that I wanted to, to bring this into it is because at the moment, you can see how many young people, well, no, it's all of us, but I can see how easy it is for young people who get that first taste of somebody being really interested in them. And of course, I've got my own daughter who's, who's just 
been in a relationship and things haven't quite gone the way she wanted them to. And, and it's like you, you have this first burst of what you believe that love should be and how it should all work out. But then it all fizzles away because it actually wasn't as genuine as we'd hoped it was going to be. Now, forgive me if you feel I'm being too vulnerable, but we, we want in this house to be very open because we're not preaching theory. We, we want to talk experience. And so what you have to understand is that there's, there's what God calls, you know, genuine love, and there's what the world calls a very shallow temporary love and actually there's a name for it and some of you have heard me talk about it before and it's called limerence and this limerence is something that's very short-lived but it's very high on passion it's incredibly high on the intimacy front where you actually feel as though this person is the best thing since sliced bread but it's very low on commitment and then often though we get totally uh, deceived by it because we, we think, yes, but the fun of it and the passion of it is much better than when you get what you would call genuine love, which is supposed to be intimacy, passion and commitment. But what it can be is a lot of intimacy and commitment, but maybe it's a bit lacking in the passion. Would I be right? Come on, all those who've been married quite a long time. Isn't that true that that's what tends to fall off the end somewhere? It's true. But you see, we get deceived because then we think because this is missing, instead of saying, do you know what? We need to transcend to a higher understanding and grow the love to where it should be. We then say, this can't be right. And so we then trade it in for a newer model. Yeah? And I want to encourage you young people not to be doing that because there's a problem with it. Because you do that once and then guess what happens? You find yourself in the same place again. And so you trade it in again and you think the next time it's going to be different. And then guess what? Exactly the same. They actually say that limerence it's, uh, is anything from three weeks to three years. So just get that. So look at Hollywood and see how many of the couples and watch their, their time slots of how long they are together. And all you have to say to yourself is, hey, I'm, I'm educated about this now. That limerence has worn off. Now you see, the wonderful thing about the love that God wants us to understand from him is that it's not that temporary stuff that's going to just have this incredible burst of passion and then suddenly fizzle out and we're left with nothing. Um, what does it say in, in Corinthians 13? And let's, let's move to that straight away because you've got to be reminded. And then I was going to show you a clip and I might show you it in a minute, but we'll see. Let's uh, see. The, the, this sort of um, limeristic love it can be with anything. It's not just in relationships, but it can even be about jobs. It can be about houses. It can be about cars. It can be about anything because it's like this burst of passion. And then it's, oh, I've had enough of that now. And we're looking for the, for the next thing. So you can see how deception is in that. Now, um, let me read. I'm going to, and then maybe we'll come to, come to the... Uh, Corinthians 13, the message. Listen to what it says. Love never gives up. We've been singing that already, haven't we? Love cares more for others than for self. Love doesn't want what it doesn't have. Love doesn't strut, doesn't have a swelled head, doesn't force itself on others, isn't always me first, doesn't fly off the handle, doesn't keep scores of the sins of others. I think I'm already re recognising that I'm not in this very well, and I think there's others who would agree about me. Yeah, um, it puts up with anything. Trust God always, always looks for the best, never looks back, but keeps going to the end. Love never dies. Now, I read somewhere which just helps put this in uh, context for you is that genuine love is the will to let those we love be perfectly themselves. 
the resolution not to twist them to fit our own image. If loving them, we do not like what they are, but only their potential likeness to ourselves, then we do not love them at all. We only love the reflection of ourselves that we find in them. That's quite powerful, isn't it? So you see, this sort of limeristic love is about me looking at you. And if I can see myself in you, I'm likely to love you. But if I don't see myself in you, I'm likely to think there's nothing there to love. Isn't that dreadful? Absolutely dreadful. And if you think about it in the context of society, isn't that where it's heading or what is most of the time the love that's been operated in? There's another word for this sort of love as well. In the individual, it's called narcissistic. Ooh, isn't that an awful word when somebody says you're a narcissist or whatever? It's not very nice, but it's about only loving what you see your reflection in. And in fact, it's self-love because you're actually loving yourself. You're not loving the person. And I want to warn you, young people, when you're wanting to get into a relationship with somebody, if they're looking at you and seeing themselves, you want to run away as fast as you can. Because it's actually very dangerous. Because they, and, and actually, we'll show the clip now. Because what, um, if you've ever seen the, the film Eat, Pray, Love, it's incredible. And, if, and I hope the words come out brilliantly because it gives you an example of what happens when this sort comes to an end. And then we'll pick it up. So, do you want to just show that now, please? I think I'm falling in love with you. I'm not who you think I am, I'm just your fantasy. No, that's bullshit. You're real. Your scars, your talent, the fact that I own a piece of crap bar and you accept that that's all I'm gonna do. Okay, this sucks. I second that. Don't be rash. I love your pain. And I love that when we're together, I can make it go away. Oh, he's good. Your love. He's hot. There's a difference. He's like a hot panini. And when I look into your eyes, I hear dolphins clapping. I did not write that line. Here's what he doesn't know yet. I disappear into the person I love. I am the permeable membrane. If I love you, you can have it all. My money, my time, my body, my dog, <laughs> my dog's money. I will assume your debts and project upon you all sorts of nifty qualities you've never actually cultivated in yourself. I will give you all this and more until I am so exhausted and depleted, the only way I can recover is by becoming infatuated with someone else. Did you hear that? That the only way that I can recover is by becoming infatuated by someone else. Now this sounds like a very hard thing to bring to you, but I'm wanting to help you not fall into the trap. Now, when we, we often say the words that when God looks at you, he sees himself. Or when God looks at you, he looks at you through Jesus. And that sounds all very nice. But after what I've said, it could look as though, well, actually, when God looks at you, Anth, he actually sees himself. Therefore, he's a narcissist and all he does is love himself. Now, I know that that is not the truth. Because actually what God does is when he sees you, he sees you as your unique individual self. And he's absolutely wild, passionately, intimately and committed to you. In the same way as to everybody else. So it's not that we're just one big clump of one person who he looks into uh, our eyes and sees himself, therefore he has that reflection back. Or so otherwise, guess what would happen? It would be over very quickly. And like it said in the film, exhausted and depleted, the only way that a recovery could be made is by becoming infatuated or having another idea, moving on and doing something else. So here's the point that I want to make. 
And then I'll I'll just give you another little testimony that is sort of uh, very personal to me. When God looks at us, he does not see himself in the sense of a reflection. But what he sees is a unique person. And he says, I love you for who you are, your unique representation of myself in the earth. Isn't that lovely? So yes, you are a unique representation of him, but he sees you as you are. And that's what makes the whole understanding of the love of God absolutely fantastic. Okay, I said I was just going to finish this little part by telling you a little testimony. Um, About 10 years ago, it was while I was in this particular situation, I had a dream. And um, it was a very interesting dream and quite, quite a scary dream and it stuck with me very much and some of, I mean some of you may know I may have told you but um, what, had ha- what had happened was that I woke up or was a, a, awake to find that I had a, a, a poisonous snake wrapped through my legs like a figure eight but many times and its head was sort of here and um, as I was aware of this snake around me um, of course I was nervous and it was like, you know, what is this? And you know, you are in dreams, it's very real. And, and I could see the head of this snake and the thought came to me that the way to deal with it is, because you watch it on the TV, you grab the snake by its head and then you deal with it that way because it's no good, you know, trying to grab it anywhere else because it's going to bite you. And so I'm in the situation where I was having to decide whether to grab the head of this snake or now this is the interesting part of the dream or do I just leave it alone and be very careful and hope that it doesn't do me any harm now the dream goes on that I thought well it's not doing me any harm because if I grab it it could still bite me if I leave it it still might bite me but it might not is it this making sense this is the dream so in the end, listen to this as, as in the context of how deception, even in our dreams, can be formulated. I made the decision to live with this snake, even to the point that I said to myself, I will never wear trousers again. This is funny, isn't it? This is in my dream. I will never wear trousers again. I will always wear a skirt because at least it'll have space. Somebody say, you daft thing. Thank you. But that's what I concluded I was going to do. Now, whether we understand the whole issue of dreams or not, I know for a fact there are a lot of stuff. If you've had a stressful day or you've been involved in stuff, then you go to bed. Isn't it funny how you can even recognize some of the the situations in your dreams? They're not the same, but you can know where it's come from and all this. I knew at that time that God was being incredibly good to me because he was giving me an opportunity at that time to make a decision to come out of the deception that I was falling into. But in that dream, I made a decision that I wasn't going to. And these were the words I said, I will live with it. Now, that's not a good idea because... Is a snake ever going to be left alone to the degree that it's not going to bite you? No. And ultimately what happened was in the reality of the situation I was in, I, I got myself into a terrible place. And of course, you could say that I got bitten pretty badly, but thankfully it wasn't fatal. And God was good. And he helped me, and you guys helped me, a lot of you helped me, and we got through an awful situation. But the reason why I felt I had to give that testimony tonight is because I really felt that it was a, well, I'll call it a prophetic word. I want to say to to some of you, you're in the situation where God's showing you things to that degree of your deception and saying, look, this is where you are, and it's time that you... Don't follow this uh, way of thinking of living with it. And you'll say, I'm going to deal with it. I'm going to go for its head. Grab it. Now, okay, there's a danger in grabbing it. 
But the truth is that once you've got it, the likelihood is that you can whip it, you know, do a Indiana Jones with it and, and, and snap it, you know, whatever you snap. <laughs> now, I've, I, like I say, I've, I've given that because I really felt God put that on my heart. You may not be having dreams about snakes wrapped around your legs, but there might be something going on in your heart that that's just triggered for you something that God's giving you uh, a little bit of a, a nudge. And I hope that it touches you because we're playing. No, that's the wrong word. We are involved in very serious things. And I do not want you to get into a position that I was. Now, that situation took a very long time to get out of. And just like the children of Israel, after they'd made those decisions, like they did over the golden calf, it took a a good long time for them to recover. Things have an awful uh, consequence on your being. It hurts you. It 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 robs you. It it tears your insides, and it it plays horrible um, tricks in your mind, and it really leaves you very incredibly damaged. And I don't want that for anybody uh, tonight. So I hope that that um, that just little uh, testimony of mine helps you. And when it comes to the understanding. Uh, of that dream for me, that snake was the deception. It was the picture of the deception and it was going to uh, take me into an awful place. And unfortunately, I didn't take heed of that dream. So I'm trusting tonight that you will, uh, if it was for anybody, talk to me afterwards, maybe. You know, I, I, I throw it out as um, a, a an opening for you to maybe come and and, and have a chat with me or a chat to a friend or whatever. But certainly let God, uh, God's spirit touch you and, um, and help you with that. Okay, that's the end of that part. And would you like to come up? Okay, so I hope you've seen the little journey that we've gone and it's been sort of compact enough for you to grasp it without there being a lot very wordy and all this, that and the other. Where I want to just bring us to now is that having understood how we can fall into deception. Like I said that at the beginning, a deceived person doesn't know that they're deceived. And in fact, that everything that's going on around them is actually giving them signals that this is great. So imagine trying to get somebody out of it. It's really hard because everything that's happening is reinforcing why they should stay where they are. So this, the, the, the end little uh, sort of wrap up is how we let go. How do we get out of this? Because I know for me that there was the the dreams I was having, there were things that people were saying, there was all sorts of various signals that were telling me in my heart if I'd have been willing to listen. And also people who were willing to speak to me and and give me direction. But of course, you're caught up in, in what you're in. So the truth is, is we have to be willing to listen to the, a sound, listen to uh, the voice, because until we see it for ourselves, we've got to be willing to hear it from others. And that's always hard, because when you go to somebody and say, you know, are you okay? What's going on? Is there a problem? And they don't want to see it. It's, they have to have trust and faith that you you're actually showing them something that is life to them as opposed to a criticism or whatever. And this is very, very difficult. However, if we are willing to listen, then the transformation will take place. And like I say, for me, it took quite a long time for me to see it for myself fully. But the sound was allowing my heart to, um, I suppose, come back alive. Um, you have to let go of the thing that is meeting your need. And that is so hard because, you know, just like the children of Israel, what they had in that golden calf, like I said, they could see it. it, it they could put it on a big mound or whatever and do their dancing around it. And it, it, it gave them something that made them feel very viable and, and very, uh, I suppose, godly or whatever the word is. Um, but of course, when Moses comes down and he starts telling them, you know, what on earth are you doing? This is terrible. All they have is great big uh, excuses. Well, you were gone and, you know, found, find ways to justify their situation. But 
Um, in the end, obviously, they would have to have to leave go of the golden calf, get rid of it, and eventually reconnect with what they knew was the word of God and the, the direction for them through Moses. And of course, you get the story completing that he gets the Ten Commandments and they carry on their journey. And finally, they arrive in the promised land, not without more problems, but they, they, they get to where they were meant to, to be going. So, little story. And uh, I don't know whether uh, there's some in here who go back as far as me who will remember this story. But do you remember... Jungle books, what are they called? Jungle, jungle doctor, jungle doctor books. There's a story about, uh, um, what do you call them that go through the jungle with a gun? Hunter! <laughs> I couldn't even think of the name. <laughs> oh, this is how stressful this is. The hunter is going through the jungle and he wants to catch uh, a monkey. And he'd found that he hadn't caught this monkey for a while. And the story goes that basically he lays a trap and it's a jar. And inside the jar, he puts some fruit. And so the monkey comes along and he puts his hand nicely in the jar and grabs the fruit. But of course, while he's holding the fruit, his hand is enlarged. So he can't get it out of the neck of the, the jar. And because he would not let go... All the hunter had then to do was very quietly walk up through the bushes and pop him off. So he lost his life because he would not let go of what was in the jar. And, uh, you know, we used to tell those sort of stories in Sunday school and whatnot all the time. I don't know what the kids thought about it. You know, going to get popped off if the... If they find a jar in the, the woods with an apple in it, I don't know. But anyway, it was probably be sure your sins would find you out because that was always the, uh, the moral, wasn't it, for it all. But anyway, um, you can see why I might uh, say this at this point. This, there, there are two sides of it. The person who has created their idol, the thing they need to make them feel good, they've got to be willing to let go of that. But there's also the other side that the people who are watching on have also got to be willing to let go of the people who have got the hands in the jar. Oh, and that's sometimes so hard because you're wanting so much for the person to be saved, to be protected, to be helped. But if they won't let go of the, the fruit in the jar, then at the end of the day, it's their choice, isn't it? And we can't uh, control that. Now, on that basis then, this end of this ministry is for all of us. It's for us to be willing to let go of the things we're holding on to and also willing to let go of the people who don't want to let go. I hope this is coming over clearly. And uh, again, I read something just the other day that helped me because I'm in a situation at the moment that I'm, I'm struggling with and trying to deal with and he says this, letting go does not mean that we don't care. Letting go does not mean that we, sh we shut down. But letting go means we stop trying to force outcomes and make people behave. It means we give up resistance to the way things are for the moment. It means stop trying to do the impossible, controlling that which we cannot, and instead focus on what is possible which is usually taking care of ourselves. And we do this in gentleness, kindness, and love as much as possible. And I also read this. It was, you will find that it's necessary to, necessary to let things go simply for the reason they are heavy. <laughs> it was just so simple. Things are heavy. And there's times when I know that I go to bed at night and my heart is just so turmoiled over so many things of people with their hands in the jar, including myself. So please don't, this is not me telling you that I'm all right. And, but there's so many things that hurt my heart because of people who've got their hand in the jar and they won't let go of the apple. And you know that the hunter's on the way, just like me with the snake. And you know that potentially I could get bitten. And it's a horrible situation. But you have to say, 
I've got to just let it go because it's too heavy. And at the end of the day, that's when we have to cast all our cares on the Lord because he cares for us. And we leave it with him. And just something else, you're going to say, hey, she's reading loads of stuff and none of it's in the Bible. Does it matter? It's like Rob Bell says, that all, all truth can be embraced, can't it? Because who is the truth? It's, it's Jesus and he allows us to see the truth in, in everything and have it for, and embrace it for ourselves. There comes a time in life when you walk away from all the drama and the people who create it and you surround yourself with people who make you laugh, you forget the bad and focus on the good, love the people who treat you right, pray for the ones who don't, life is too short to be anything but happy, falling down is a part of life, but getting back up is living. And I want to live. Do you want to live? And so my appeal to you all tonight is, first of all, let somebody point you in the way of freedom. If, if you can't see that you're in deception, let somebody at least tell you and, and listen and hear and allow them to, to direct you the way out. Be willing to let go of the thing you've created because ultimately it could cost you your life. Now, when I say that, I don't mean your life but you know what I mean your life in the context of uh, just the imprisonment of your soul or what it might uh, rob you of and uh, and I think that that's it I've done is that okay I'm finished thank you so much